I don't know who's going to win. I don't think I trust all the, all the polls are showing. I know Biden is well ahead. I really don't trust this. I remember feeling the same when Hillary Clinton, everybody thought she'd done it. Um, so I just don't know who's going to win. I know who I really don't want to win, and you can guess who that is, because four more years with him, he's wrecked all the foundations of US governance, um, you know, stable pillars. He's wrecked them all, as he promised. He promised to do that. If they bring him back, they may as well say goodbye to American democracy. So do you, do you think that Trump He's posted a video uh, a while ago on his Twitter um, and, and he's been saying it a little bit at rallies and things. You know, there was a video saying Trump 2020, Trump 2024, Trump 28, you know, and so on. I can't remember where he finishes. I think it's something like 2064. Do you think he's um, aiming to, to sort of become a, a dictator or something like that? Yeah, I do think that. And I think... You know, this is how this is how if you look at the history of, of Germany never forget that people voted for Hitler. Hitler had these populist rallies. Democracy brought us, brought the Germans and the rest of the world, one of the most evil um, uh, leaders in the Western world. He used democracy to become an elected dictator. And Trump is doing the same. He's not Hitler. But I am saying that there is a new breed of global leaders who are, in essence, uh, despots. But they build their base by using democracy, lies, emotion, uh, the hatred of the other, um, you know, we, fake hope, like, you know, I'm going to make it the greatest country in the world. And Trump is only one of them. I would argue that Erdogan in, in Turkey is another one. Narendra Modi in India is another one. Um, I think we have a leader who, who has the makings of this, um, although he likes to be seen as a cheeky chappy. Um, Poland used democracy to create an autocracy. So I do believe that it's possible Donald Trump will win. And if Donald Trump wins, then, as I said, American democracy is done and gone. So what do you think his, his aim is? You, I mean, I have to say that I find the comparisons to Hitler, like, from my own reading of the situation to be quite quite hyperbolic really they seem like an exaggeration to me i mean i could be proven to be wrong um but does it not seem to you like hit the ideology on which hitler's you know horrible reign was was built is is quite different to, to trump's or would you draw many parallels you know well, do you think trump you, in the same way I saying he was he was um, he is following Hitler's ideology he's following Hitler's method, method. and he probably never heard of Hitler but he's doing exactly what Hitler did so well which is to convince a vast number of people that they were victims of some vast conspiracy against them that there was an establishment yeah that didn't have their interest at heart that they were the forgotten people. So he, he's using exactly the same methods. And you have to ask, how is it possible in a, in a the great, well, they say they are the biggest and greatest democracy in the world, the, the leading nation, if you like, of, of democracy has imprisoned and separated children from their parents. And, and nobody even knows where 600 children went. I'm talking about the Mexican um, uh, border crosses. How is that possible in a country which has 
you know, human rights and law and order and justice. Once you create a them and us, once you create the external threat, whether it's, you know, remember one of his first um, um, rule, uh, promised laws was the banning of anybody from any Muslim country to come into the United States. That was his first thing that caught the imagination of, of his base. Build a wall, hate the Mexicans. Um, his attitude towards Black Lives Matter. He's forever creating this, this impression amongst impressionable people who many of them have, you know, have never had a good life, right? That he is their extraordinarily strong leader who will save them from all these external enemies. So the method is, and there's a wonderful, a really wonderful and very important article written by, I think, one of the world's greatest journalists, whose name is Fintan O'Toole. He's Irish and he writes in the Irish Times. And he wrote an article just about four or five months ago about how pre-fascism happens. And it's a, anybody who's interested should read it. And he's, it was like building blocks. You put them all in place. You discredit the mainstream media. You start attacking the judiciary, which is what's happening in the United Kingdom too. You start talking about the, the external threat and then you talk about the establishment. And this is how, this is, these are all the conditions for pre-fascism. So I certainly don't think Donald Trump is Hitler. And I certainly don't think he's building factories to murder people, but he has built a concentration camp. Yeah, at the, uh, Trump at the, has built a concentration camp. Yeah. Hmm? Trump has built a concentration yeah, the, where he's holding these children and the people are crossing the border. It has been described by American journalists as a concentration camp. That why why are these people being held because they tried to do what every American ancestor tried to do, which is to migrate to the United States. And and. The fact that 600 children have gone missing in the United States, and this is only revealed last week. Where is the conscience of this nation now? Can you imagine what would happen if there were white children? So he's created this mood, I think. So you cannot write him off. And he's, I was watching him actually. He's very smart. People think he's stupid and he does this tweeting and he doesn't, you know, use his language poorly. He's actually incredibly smart. I watched him playing the audience. I was quite gripped, actually. Yeah, by how he does it. He develops a very intimate relationship with this vast crowd and 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 relates something to them which which is, I think, very, very, very clever, which most other politicians can't do. I'm one of you. And he's not one of you. He's a billionaire. But he's got a great gift of communicating. And people underestimate him, I think. I think that's a very interesting point. And uh, I think I first heard Russell Brand um, talking about this on, on his podcast. Um, and he was sort of saying that one of the great mistakes of the media who, you know, large swathes of the media do not like Donald Trump. Um, a lot of op-eds are against Donald Trump, um, which obviously plays into his narrative of media bias. Um, but one of the things that Russell Brand said is actually that, you know, Trump can be incredibly funny um, you know, on light-hearted issues. He's a very good speaker, public speaker. You know, he might use simple language to convey um, his thoughts, but, you know, people want simple language. They don't want things that are difficult to understand. So, you know, to what extent do you think people have underestimated Trump and kind of painted him as this buffoon? And, you know, 
Do you think that this has actually played rather well into Trump's hands? Um, and, and do, you know, do, do you think that there's a media bias or do you just think that Trump's so terrible that there's no other, there's no other... Um... No, I, I think he's a very dangerous and a terribly um, uh, dishonest, immoral leader. I have no, no kind word to stay, say about him as a leader. But what I think people underestimate is his charisma and his ability to communicate with audiences. Now, I don't think the media has been biased against him. What they have been, they, they underestimate him. And you know, this may be an odd comparison, but I was born and raised in Uganda, okay? And, you, and, and we had a, um, a, a, an army leader, Idi Amin, who was very big and brutish and very much like Trump. He loved joking. He, he would appear to be quite a buffoon, but he was incredibly cunning and he knew exactly how to arouse people. And I used to get so angry when Private Eye used to run these ha 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 big black idiot um, items on him because I'd seen him in action. I knew what he could do with crowds. He knew what he was doing all the time. And people in the West completely misunderstood him. And I feel that that's happening with Trump. People misunderstand his power. That's, that's a very good point. Um, so in terms of the issue of media bias, um, a lot has been made of the, you know, suppression of the Biden corruption allegations um, among Trump's supporters. They're sort of saying that this is completely biased, unacceptable censorship by big tech, um, that this is a, you know, 200 plus years old paper um, and they're being blocked from sharing their story. Um, what do you make of that whole thing? Um, do you well, think the New, York any Times. the New York Times investigation? No, the New York Post thing. You know, obviously, the New York Post is a tabloid. There's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of Trump supporters saying this is a 200 year old paper founded by Alexander Hamilton, but it does seem to be rather like the Sun, but just a New York version of it, um, regardless of how old it is. But but what do you make of of the allegations, nonetheless, of corruption? Um, in the Biden family? Do you think it's at all relevant to the election? Do you, do you <laughs> care about it? We talk about corruption in the Biden family. I mean, I'm, you know, I have no uh, grand love affair with Joe Biden at all. Um, yeah. But, you know, we know how much corruption the Trump family has been involved in, you know, from Kushner to Trump's son to, and that's for bias, Fox News. Fox News is Trump's voice. All these shock jobs across America, right? They were Trumpists before Trump. There is a whole, there's a very important book that was written uh, by an American woman called Jane uh, Jay Mayer, and it's called Dark Money. I don't know if you've come across it. It's the most important okay. book if you want to understand how we've ended up in some of the, the politics we've ended up with, of course, with, um, um, oh God, what's his name, his backer that he sacked eventually, Steve Bannon, Bannon. That book, right? If you read that book, you absolutely understand how sections of the right-wing media, how billionaires, how think tanks backed by billionaires, actually for years, for years, have been planning for this kind of leader to come forth. In a way, you could even argue that Trump is their puppet. Uh, and he has his old, and, and some of this is happening in our country too. So Jane Mayer actually attended meetings. I don't know how she did it. And she's never been sued. And, you know, listened to these people planning their takeover of America. They want to destroy liberal democracy. They want uh, almost the most minimal state. 
that it is possible to have, probably just an army. They want a, a survival of the fittest. I mean, it's quite a book to read. So I don't think the Trump um, uh, side can complain that the media is against them. There are, you know, some newspapers are absolutely right to be against Trump and what he does. But equally, he's got very powerful friends. I mean, Steve Hilton, yeah, on Fox News. Steve Hilton was David Cameron's uh, special advisor. Steve Hilton is one of his biggest cheerleaders. And he has a huge following. Right? Nothing Trump does is wrong. You, you know, I don't know what's happened to the alt-right lot. But they too were cheering for Trump. And I'm no doubt that we have those people now. What I can't understand, though, know, what I can't understand is how religious black people are voting for Trump. I can't understand that. I, I really don't get it. There was an interesting interview in uh, The Guardian uh, on Saturday, last Saturday, in the magazine with a highly intelligent African-American woman in her 40s who's wearing a Trump um, shawl around her. And the, the journalist asked her, why would you do this? And her answer, again, it's very important to listen. She says that the Democrats just feel sorry for people like us. Trump tells us we can beat this, and we can be somebody. And I was really interested in that, that she felt humiliated by the constant portrayal of the Democratic Party as black people, as needy, needing help, uh, you know, all of this, as, as victims. And she didn't want to be one. So we need to be much, much more uh, uh, kind of complicated about how we understand the Trump phenomenon. Do you think that that also, um, however, points to a need to be more, to go more in depth on issues that the, that the left um, push? Because obviously we live in an age where there are a lot of, you know, virtue signalers, people who like to claim that they genuinely espouse a progressive ideology um, when in fact I, I find myself questioning you know when I see celebrities um, saying go out there and vote kind of implying that they're voting for Biden um, when I see them kind of standing with the people who are marching in the name of Black Lives Matter. Um, oh I so disagree with you on all of those I so disagree with you this you is the right wing way I mean I even hate the the term virtue signaling. This is. I thought you would hate the term virtue signaling, but do allow me to finish my point. My point is not is not um, is my point is not against that. I do I, I do find that um, if if there was a bit more nuance to 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 some of um, the way that that these progressive this progressive ideology was promoted, um, if it was a bit more constructive and less and less about the kind of less about what's gone wrong and more about how to fix it, that people like the lady that you mentioned in The Guardian, um, she, might, she might feel like voting for Biden more if it was less about not being Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you feel that, that there's, there's something missing in terms of you know, how we can constructively move forward with a progressive society as opposed to just kind of talking all the time about the problems which which are huge there are huge problems and anyone who disagrees with with you know the, the statement black lives matter is a, is a is obviously a racist person you know so um i'm not again I mean, not, I, i'm not sure i agree with you that it's always all, all been about um problems i think one thing that black lives matter or me too um has energized sectors of the population into not accepting whatever was done to them. It, to me, it's a force of great power and energy. Who would have thought that a group of young women would have brought down Harvey Weinstein? He was doing what he was doing for decades. 
he was that powerful. Me Too came along and actually told their story, which was about being a victim, but then used that story to bring down this man. Black Lives Matter too is, is you know, it starts with six years ago with this appalling story of America where trigger happy cops have been shooting down black people for the longest time and never ever you know had to answer for it or, or been punished for it and we have some of that in the UK too so it starts with that but it has become such a power both over there and across the world that institutions that never ever thought of changing I mean Sainsbury's Sainsbury's, a supermarket, right? Actually, and you say, you know, this was, you think, you might think it was virtue signaling, but a supermarket decides overtly to say they support Black Lives Matter and they're celebrating Black History Month and they're creating special, um, uh, uh, you know, giving their Black staff a huge number of privileges so that they feel able to finally take some power. Now, who thought Sainsbury's could do that? So I think a lot of these things are being shouted down and insulted because people can see how, how much power lies behind them. Moral power. It's, it's not military power, it's moral power. And I think there were there are lots of parallels between Me Too and Black Lives Matter. Um, and I've just written an article, you know, I come from a community where we've been very racist against black people for centuries. And and for the first time, and it's an unaddressed issue, right? It's in our society we have the most awful words we use and the most dreadful ways we look down on dark skinned people. It's all to do with skin colour. And um, our, a lot of younger generation Asians have been stirred by Black Lives Matter and they're confronting their elders. So what I'm saying is that progressive politics is extraordinarily positive and powerful when, it, when you look at it in terms of the most important happenings. But at other points, I think what this woman was saying there, there was a point to it that, you know, why don't you talk about our capacities of what we are able to achieve? And that's what, you know, the NAACP, Martin Luther King and all of that lot were able to do both. They kind of told people, you can do this and you can be this. And we need more leaders like that, I think because otherwise people feel crushed by circumstances. And when they give up, you can't lift them out of it after a while, I think. So, so the point that you made there about Sainsbury's is, is very interesting because in, in some ways, I think what happened at Sainsbury's, and it links back to this lady that you're talking about in The Guardian. I, I would like to read that article. It sounds very interesting. There are three, it, it, it's in the magazine. And there were several interviews with unusual people who are voting for Trump. That's, yeah, it sounds really interesting. So say, what, what happened with Sainsbury's? So it's very admirable that they want to stand with the Black Lives Matter movement. However, I would say that, that this is an example of what I was talking about before. So it's great to say, oh, we're going to have safe spaces for black employees in a way, but... I, I guess the Martin Luther King way of doing it would be to get, you know, black and white people talking together for a more constructive way forward, as opposed to just kind of segregating people. I don't really appreciate people like Lawrence Fox. I've got to say, I don't appreciate Lawrence Fox. I think he's cashing in on the reactionary right movement and that whole publicity thing of him disagreeing with Sainsbury's. I didn't like that. Um, and, and I'm not standing with that. Um, but I think a more, uh, my more important point to that is that rather than creating these safe spaces, I think they should look to get some black people, some people of color onto the board of Sainsbury's, which is all white. I think that would be a, a better step 
than than creating these safe spaces and promoting this kind of um well listen something on the, the problem with that is the problem with that is we've got very powerful black and asian people in power in this country and they do i'm sorry bugger all for ordinary black and asian people in fact they're more right wing than white people have ever been in this position of power i'm talking about Priti patel i'm talking about some uh, um, black people in um, boris johnson's government right so they've got into power and they will do nothing for the rest of, of, of us. It's far better, and I do a lot of work internationally in the United States across Europe on diversity and inclusion. It's incredibly important for these spaces, not just for black people, but for gay people, for um, um, disabled people to have that time to build each other up. But in the end, you're right, it's about alliances. Without alliances, nothing changes. I grew up at a time when we, we, I was in the anti-racist alliance in, in um, the 80s and 90s. Rock Against Racism was a completely multiracial organization and movement. And Black Lives Matter is a multiracial movement. Every footage, all the footage I've seen, wherever I've seen it, People of all backgrounds have come together, and this is the power of it. So the, to give their black staff um, space to be able to talk, which is, you know, often it's extremely isolating. Okay, I'm one of, I was the first columnist of color in this country on a national newsfeed, ever, right? Which is a scandal. Uh, it's not a matter of pride to me, it's a matter of shock and scandal that it took so long for the newspapers to open their doors. So I was the first person of color and Gary Young was the second. Now, there are very few of us still and Gary and I and a couple of others have to talk to each other sometimes because of how we are attacked. Ceaselessly, constantly, mercilessly attacked all the time on social media. We need each other because sometimes it can feel as if you're, the own, you're all alone and these racists are coming for you. So, you know, there are some emotional reasons why we do this. I mean, this goes back to the early days of feminism when I became a feminist and we wanted women-only spaces. So we could become a, a little bit more confident and strong than we were individually. Which didn't mean we weren't going to fall in love with men or have men on our side and all of that. But it did give us some strength. Yeah, and I think, to be honest, you know, if, if I worked at Sainsbury's, you know, on an individual level, on, 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 a, on a smaller level, who cares, you know, if, 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 if you're white and you work at Sainsbury's, I doubt you're going to care. You know, you, you'll probably think that's great. You're not going to be, you're not going to feel like, oh, I really need to get into that safe space as well. I feel terrible. You know, I don't think there's going to be some huge uprising, which is why I say that I think I sort of condemn the, the, the way Lawrence Fox used that. Uh, I thought that was just pretty cynical um, and, and pr just pretty boring, to be honest, because we've got a lot more to talk about than, than yeah. Sainsbury's way of saying that they're on board with Black Lives Matter. Um, you've done a lot for the anti-racist um, movement. Um, what does it mean today to be anti-racist? It's a really good question. I think we've gone backwards. So we're kind of beginning the struggle all over again. So I was watching a very interesting documentary on uh, Rock Against Racism last week. It's a brilliant documentary um, on how it started and the footage and Enoch Powell was making all this, uh, you know, had all this talk about we're going to send back all the my dark, darky mi migrants and all this. And watching it, it didn't feel like history. It felt, you see, I don't think history goes in a straight line. The biggest problem we progressives 
have, or or if you like, people who believe in post enlightenment uh, history, there is this stupid belief that things get better, and there is a kind of line, you know, human progress, and the and things can only get better, and that's just doubt. History isn't a straight line upwards into some enlightenment it's cyclical and it often crashes and all that has been achieved look look at look at eastern europe right the the berlin wall fell and all that jubilation and all that expectation look at those countries today look at hungary look at poland yeah that neo fascism i was talking about has come to take hold of those countries so we have to be prepared for these times when everything seems to crash and rebuild and come together. And where I think mistakes are being made with black nation and minority politics is that identity politics, with which I don't agree at all, at all, at all, is doing what happened in the colonies. We, you know, people are divided and solipsistic and therefore cannot build a broad and strong alliance with those who are different from us. I can't bear it because I've always been part of a broad movement, which is connected my uh, kind of socialism with anti-racism and feminism. And to see, you know, Muslims, my fellow Muslims, even using a special word for racism now, it's racism. Why do you need to call it Islamophobia? It's racism. Okay? Uh, and not being conscious of how other people are suffering, if not as uh, actually more than us. Um, not being able to form alliances. And the only people who benefit from this are those who are racist, nationalists, those who want to crush us. So I'm at a very depressing point in my personal history because I think identity politics has become one of the greatest obstacles to progressive politics. It's interesting that you said that you and I for some reason I just had a hunch as the word the two words are coming out of my mouth that you didn't like the term virtue signal signaling uh, at all and I thought you wouldn't uh, uh, and I sort of hesitated a bit before saying it uh, but you know, there you go. But but uh, it's also equally interesting that you say that you don't like identity politics because that essentially is is almost what that term virtue signaling is about. It's about um, people using people creating a kind of d divisive way of promoting otherwise very admirable causes. At the end I of the don't day, I think that's virtue signaling. I don't think that is. I mean, they say, for example, somebody accused um, Bill Gates of virtue signaling because he's spending money on, on uh, malaria treatments, right? If this is invented by the, by the right, I wrote a book three, three years ago. They did the same with political correctness. They started with political correctness. Then we went to woke. Then we went to snowflakes. Now it's virtue yeah. signaling. This I, is all right-wing propaganda. I wrote a book in defense of political correctness. And I pointed out how important language and how we use language is. There was a, uh, there's a wonderful quote in the book, two quotes. In Coriolanus, um, where, you know, this great, brave Roman soldier says, where I've taken the blows, I fled from words. Words hurt more than blows sometimes. And there's a fantastic quote in the book, and I can't remember the name of the US Supreme Court, court judge, who took part, I think, in uh, some of the um, trials when they tried the Nazis. And he has this extraordinary quote about the limits of free speech and how um, if you, if you, if you, for minorities and, and powerless people, when speech is used against them, it is a kind of wound from which, you know, they cannot rise. So 
to me, this is just part of right-wing propaganda. To me, it's also very interesting that um, these people who say it's free speech, free speech, free speech, whenever I criticize them, whenever I say who, they, who I think they are, uh, people on the right, they get extremely upset, extremely upset. And, you know, write to my editor, threaten, abuse me ceaselessly on social media. I joked six or seven years ago, I was on television and we were talking about feminism and, and men and um, uh, privileged white men and power. Uh, part of a panel discussion and the presenter just laughingly turned to me, Ga um, Gavin Esler, who's on the BBC, and said, sometimes you must wish that we might, white men would disappear or, you know, get, or got, the world didn't have us or something like that. And I laughed and I said, yeah, I do actually. It was a joke. They have been chased pursuing me for six years. If you look on social media, you'll see it. She wants white men exterminated. And they, they attack the BBC, they attack Sky News, everywhere I'm on, they accuse them of having somebody who's a, what do they call me? A man hater. And yet these are the same people who will say it's free speech. It's my right, you know, to say migrants should get out of my country or whatever, whatever. So it's as, you know, as I've said, in the, it, there is a very serious right-wing political uh, preciousness and power, which is actually curtailing the free speech of many people. But we don't talk about that because they've now got all the vocabulary that Obviously they're now that. using. And um, I think, you know, I, I'm not talking about, I really am not talking about the nitpicking. We too have to be careful, you know, when everything, like, you know about Great British Bake Off? Yeah. Yeah? There's been a big row this week because they, they, were, they were asked to do Japanese um, baking. That was the theme, right? They had to do all kinds of Japanese baking and one thing was to make cakes. And a few people got made cakes but had Chinese symbols instead of Japanese symbols. So they had somebody made panda shaped cakes. Oh my God. There's been such a row about that. You know, this is racism. It's cakes. It's cakes. You know? So I hate it when it, or when people say, you know, a gay person must play a gay person uh, in all movies. I, I'm not with any of that. So that, 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 that type of thing is specifically what I was referring to when I was using that that kind of, you know, what you're describing as right-wing propaganda, the term virtue signaling, that is what I mean. It's this sort of superficial stuff that doesn't really get to the core of the issue. I think there was an example, um, I think it was a kind of backlash against Jamie Oliver for, for making, uh, for, for publishing a recipe to Caribbean jerk rice and the, the recipe being wrong and that being an example of huge racism it's not, it doesn't seem to be very important uh, that uh, cultural appropriation or not. Um, I mean, it, it's just not important. The fact that we're even discussing this, you know, in, in limited time, but it is, a, it is, it is a, it is a, a very important yeah. point. And so, actually in my, I, I remember writing, a, a writing about that saying, food is the one thing that cultures are able to exchange and learn from and adapt and, Food is the best passport between cultures and communities and people, right? And if we start nationalizing food, what hope is there? You know, food is, food is the first thing we offer each other when we come as strangers to a new country. When food is the first thing they receive from us. That's one thing they do take with happiness. Everything else is quite tough, but... So I wrote a book about that, saying, you know, a, a long time ago about how food and the mixing of food and how we've adapted each other's 
food is one of the great stories of human nature, if you like. So this idea of food appropriation is just silly. It's a waste of energy. Have to, where I think there was a point, and that does make me angry, it's that kind of white star celebrity chefs get all the opportunities on television, get to make so much money, right? And uh, you hardly ever see black or Asian um, food presenters on British television. Hardly ever. And so it does irk that, you know, Ram Gordon Ramsay stands up and says, here is how you make chicken curry. I don't mind him making chicken curry. It's probably very good. But wouldn't it be nice if somebody else got a turn and made some money on this? Do you see what I mean? So I think there's an economic argument to be made, but not a cultural argument at all. Yeah. I mean, but do, do you think that people like, you know, when it comes to things like that, how, how can we manage, you know, how can we ensure that, that there's a, you know, a more diverse array of celebrity chefs or, you know, that there are lots of different examples. What's the best way of doing it? Is it, is it having, I mean, you can't, it's impossible to have like a quota on who's successful uh, in a, in a, in something where you're kind of like, it's each for their own, you know, all celebrity chefs I'm imagining have their own companies or they're self-employed. It's a bit like saying there's got to be a quota on successful, I don't know, musicians or, you know, you, it, it's different. You know, I mean, I'm sure there are things that can be done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you become famous because you get exposure. Yeah. And you get rich because you get exposure. So it's, and actually Black Lives Matter has had a huge impact here as well. Suddenly you're seeing many more black musicians and emerging black musicians and actors and directors and um, chefs, not so much yet, but of course, uh, Master Chef and so on shows the extraordinary talent we do have. But it is laziness in part, I think, um, those who run television companies, you know, just love the same old, same old. They know Jamie Oliver, they know Nigella, they know Gordon Ramsay, and they're lazy. They are not seeking out the new talent. And even when you get it, there have been one or two brilliant young Asian female uh, cooks and chefs who appeared on uh, uh, TV. I mean, Nadia is the exception. Nadia Hussain is doing very well. She won Bake Off. She's a Muslim woman who has a head skull and she's flying. She's one of the big, big breakthroughs. But I know what will happen now. In fact, a very senior man at um, the BBC said, we were talking about this, he said, well, you've got Nadia now, what more do you want? And I said, well, that would be like me saying to you, you've got Jamie Oliver now, what more do you want? You know, I mean, is that all you think it takes, just one to occupy the space so you've got an alibi? Um, and, but no, I think, I think something has begun to change. But like I said, we could go crash right down again. But for a minute, for this time, I, I have felt so much as if we're truly reflect, publishing is changing, um, newspapers are doing much more. And I feel the country is reflecting itself better than, than before, before Black Lives Matter. And, and in all this, relating it back to what's, you know, going to go down on Tuesday, um, one of the main criticisms of Trump is that he's a racist. Um, what are the, you know, the most potent examples of, of racism that you could cite. Um, I interviewed somebody yesterday who, who had, had a, a long list and I'm sure there'll be an, an overlap here. Um, but I, you know, I think, I think it's important for, for um, people to explain you know, why it is that they believe Trump is racist. Well, he is racist and I don't follow uh, American news as in, in that much detail, but his response to I mean, to me, the, the most chilling thing about him is how he's 
instinctively supports hard right white militia in America. His instincts are with them. And it was it in Carolina, wherever it was that Black Lives Matter, there was an attack on them and somebody was killed. And his instincts are his instincts are really not ever with um, people of color. He, it's almost as, and that's one thing, he's got no filter. He's, it just, com it comes through. The first thing he'll say is, I support the police, whatever they do. Um, these guys, you know, these guys, are, the white guys who are coming out to protest and do say what they mean, you know, I'm on, I'm with them. That's what I have seen. He has never shown at all, I've never heard him say anything at all about African Americans and how they have suffered for centuries in this country. So to me, it's very clear that he has a real problem with, with um, uh, and it, I think maybe it's because of the apprentice, he likes winners. He's got a world in which some people are winners and others are losers. And African Americans see him are losers. And that's how he thinks. And he has, I think, emboldened racists in the United States. Um, you know, leadership means a lot. A leader can, people can think what they think can't stop people thinking but in the public space there are some leaders who can keep the public space civilized and some leaders who absolutely churn the public space up and make the vulnerable much more vulnerable and overexcite the powerful and and actually make it very difficult for minorities to 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 speak or be in that public space. And up to a point, I feel like that myself, that, you know, the, the kind of atrocious targeting I'm getting at the moment. I'm only human. And I often think, should I just stop and, and slink away? And that's what they want. And that's not right. I'm a taxpayer. I've been to pay taxes for, you know, ever since I've, was 21. I'm a citizen, I'm British, and I have as much right to speak as anybody else. So I think leadership matters, and your leader, and up to a point, our leader, have really corrupted the public space. Well, it's a, it's a huge issue, and uh, it, it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens on Tuesday because most people that I've spoken to believe that it's going to be a Biden landslide. Um, yeah, I don't think so. But, uh, but, yeah, but, but people have said all sorts of things and, uh, and of course there are these similarities that one can draw between um, the situation in 2016 and the situation now. Um, my, my, fi my final uh, question on, with regards to the election is specifically on the coronavirus pandemic. Um, Trump, there, there are many of Trump's detractors saying, and indeed Biden, um, kind of saying that he's responsible for, for 210,000 deaths um, and kind of using that, that type of language with regards to the degree um, to which he's responsible for those deaths. He seems to have a very brazen attitude with regards to the virus, holding these huge rallies. You know, he's going to do 11 of them or something like that. In the final two days so it seems like he doesn't treat the um, combating the virus as a huge priority um, however what do you think he could have done more to control the, the, the spread of the virus and to what extent do you think he's directly responsible for those american deaths i don't think one can ever say you killed two hundred thousand people but like i said leadership counts and he encouraged people, and he's still doing it, to believe, A, it's not that bad, it's not that serious, B, that it might be a conspiracy, 
see, you can do what you like and there'll be no consequences. Um, you don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to keep your distance. So one could say is he didn't kill these people, but he has a large responsibility for the spread of the virus because leaders can make or break a nation. And he, I don't know why he, he, will, he still doesn't get it. I still don't understand. He even got the illness himself. And yet, you know, he is incredibly irresponsible. The first job of a prime minister or a president is the health and safety of his, his people. That's the first job. And when you endanger that by showing little understanding or responsibility, you're not fit to be a leader. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's very, very clear and you make some very good points there. Um, it's very clear, you know, who, who you think should be out of office. Um, whilst you did say that you're, uh, you know, you're not a huge, huge Biden supporter, that seems to be the, the prevailing um, thing um, for people who, who want Trump out of office and probably actually among a fair amount of, you know, registered Democrats, they just want no more Trump. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. On a more lighthearted note, as this is normally the, the greatest music of all time podcast, and it's still the greatest music of all time podcast in name, at least. Uh, my final question for you is, you know, who, who are the, what, what's the music that means the most to you, that has the most sentimental value to you? Um, reggae and um, old um, Indian movie songs, really old songs. Um, and I, that's what I, I listen to that. I mean, I, I have a very wide, uh, you know, I, I love music of all sorts. I just, today, Bruce Springsteen arrived in the voice, which is great. Um, but sentimental uh, uh, um, love for old Indian music and reggae. 